welcome to this bonus and final episode of Dow's Your Way to Psychic Power. Previously, we looked at where science and the spirit meet. We asked, have you lived before? And we dropped in on an actual past life dowsing session. In this last episode, we get close up and personal with one of the science's greatest mysteries and look at dowsing's quantum connection. There seems to be a link between the principles of dowsing and the world of quantum physics. In fact, the more I look into both, the more things in common I find. Early in the 20th century, physicists like Max Planck, Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg and Erwin Schrödinger shocked their scientific colleagues with new theories that flew in the face of classical physics. The world they described turned the orthodox Newtonian model of large things from suns to billiard balls, behaving machine-like and predictably on its head. The new field of quantum mechanics, dealing with very small things like subatomic particles, was an Alice in Wonderland realm in which the bullet arrives before the triggers pulled, an object is in two places at the same time, and two particles can communicate across millions of miles at a speed 10,000 times faster than the speed of light. Bohr's contemporary J.B.S. Haldane stated, The universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. Reflecting on quantum mechanics some 75 years ago, the British physicist Sir Arthur Eddington complained that the theory made as much sense as Lewis Carroll's poem Jabberwocky, in which slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. But the pioneers of the new thinking stuck to their guns, and now, over a century later, their discoveries are in common use in laser technology, the transistor, the electron microscope, magnetic resonance imaging, spectroscopy, fibre optics, to name but a few 21st century applications. But what has all this got to do with the world of dowsing? Well, there seems to be demonstrable convergences in both quantum and dowsing phenomena. When we dowsers access information beyond our five senses, it could be argued that in the language of the quantum physicist, we cause a collapse of the wave function. What this means is that the act of observing, or dowsing, somehow prompts the energies that are floating about us as waves of probability to become particles, which then assume a shape and become a reality. And this mystical connection between dowser and target is very like the phenomenon of quantum entanglement. Based on the quantum theory concept, I contend that the observer, the subtle energy dowser, actually creates the reality he or she douses. Our intent changes the energies around us and conjures form. When we say to a client, I found several lines of detrimental energy in your home and some negative energy spirals, I've now removed them and your living space is clean. We're not being strictly accurate. According to quantum theory, we dowsers don't find the black lines associated with geopathic stress. We bring them into reality. Reality is just behaving in accordance with the expectations of the observer. Whoa, that's nonsense, you say. A client may have had problems in their home or office for months or years before calling in a dowser as a last resort. So how could the dowser apparently be creating the black lines they didn't even know existed until they were called in? Counterintuitive though this notion is, that's what happens, says quantum theory. The dowser conjures those negative energies into being with his or her 
own consciousness. The fact that they were causing problems before they appeared to even exist is just one aspect of the weird world of quantum physics, where effect can happen before cause. Those pesky black lines collapsed into reality because the consciousness of the dowser was destined to, quotes, observe them. And it doesn't matter whether it took a thousand years for the dowser to arrive, because in the dimension we're dealing with, linear time doesn't exist. All time is now. This would explain why two dowsers find different lines of detrimental energy in the same location. It's their human consciousness that is giving form to their own expectations. This topsy-turvy phenomenon is simply one element in the zoo of quantum paradoxes at work. This one's known as retrocausality and posits that cause seems to reach back through time to create effect. To even the most easygoing and open-minded of dowsers, this may seem a hypothesis too far. But if for the sake of the argument it is possible, it doesn't negate anything dowsing's achieved or will achieve in the future. In fact, some in the science community would contend that dowsers are among the most effective at carrying out humanity's destiny by being co-creators with God, or however you refer to the divine. We are, so to speak, co-architects of the universal master plan. So, what does this mean when we douse the energies at a sacred site? Is the energy there, waiting for us to discover it? Or is it our own consciousness that transmutes the inert wave into something which we call an energy line? By our intention to find energies, are we projecting a part of our inner being onto the world around us? Are we working in partnership with the rules of the quantum universe? And what about those wave functions that might have been collapsed by previous dowsers? Does our arrival on the scene just add to the melange of energies floating about the place? Whatever we're doing, many leading physicists would contend that we are creating a desired outcome by causing the waves of infinite probability that exist throughout the cosmos to collapse into the shape and the form already in our minds. But where did that shape and form in our minds come from in the first place? Did they already exist in the mind of a creator who ordained that his plan would only unfold if human consciousness provided the catalyst? Well, cheerleader of this hypothesis was the towering figure of American theoretical physicist John Archibald Wheeler, colleague of Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr, and mentor to many of today's leading physicists. Famous for coining the terms black hole, quantum foam and wormhole, he believed creation is triggered by our consciousness. As in the quantum world, all time is now, past events and present thoughts interact. Wheeler, who died in 2008, aged 96, wasn't a nutty professor. He was greatly respected in the world of science, a large section of which now shares his belief that human consciousness is a key participant in the unfolding reality of the cosmos. The principle of the observer creates reality is dramatically demonstrated in quantum physics's celebrated double slit experiment. According to the aforementioned physics colossus Richard Feynman, it captures the central mystery of quantum theory. It's almost as if we humans live in two parallel universes with different rules that overlap at the edges. The best brains in the business have sought to explain the seemingly impossible results of this famous or is it infamous experiment, but so far no one succeeded. But its legacy is a mind-altering view of our world. 
Dowsers would probably find it easier to accept than many physicists, whose only way of coping with its spooky phenomena is to shut it out of their minds. As Dowsers, we're well used to the concept. Something happens, but I don't know why. All I know is that it happens. The double slit experiment is all about energies, the sort that we Dowsers love. Few scientists these days disagree that everything around us is made of atoms, and atoms are made of energy. This energy comprises electrons, protons and neutrons, called particles. A particle is what we perceive as matter of some sort, something with mass. Tables and chairs, buildings, mountains, you and me, are made of particles. But a particle is a quantum Jekyll and Hyde, because it has another self lurking in its being called a wave, which is an undulating disturbance in the world around us. A wave is a vibration of energy. A particle is mass and forms the building blocks of everything. Note the apparent diametrically opposed properties of each. The double slit experiment was conceived by a scientist called Thomas Young before quantum theory was a twinkle in anyone's eye, but it went on to turn the scientific world upside down. Young performed his experiment to prove that Newton was wrong in asserting that light was made up of little particles. Young said that light travelled through the ether as waves. To prove it, he shone a beam through a metal sheet with a slit in it, and a vertical band of light appeared on the screen which had been placed behind the slit. So far, so good. Just what you'd expect. He then shone the light through two parallel slits, and instead of getting two parallel bands, he got something looking like an oversized barcode, bands of light and shade. Young was delighted at this because it proved that the light had passed through the slits as waves because it had formed what is known as an interference pattern and was behaving just like the waves he'd created in a tank of water when he conducted an earlier experiment. An interference pattern is always caused when waves spread out after passing through the slits and collide with one another. So far in the experiment, everything had gone to plan, and he'd proved Newton wrong. Light was definitely made of waves. But over a century later, well after quantum theory was invented, scientists decided to see what would happen if they fired particles through the slits, like a gun shooting marbles. For ease of use, they employed photons, particles of light, when one slit was fired at, things went just as expected. A vertical bar appeared. But when they used both slits, instead of the expected two bars, an interference pattern materialised. How could this be? How could a particle, a little piece of matter like a ball bearing, behave like a wave? To try to work it out, baffled physicists decided to fire one photon at a time so it couldn't be suggested that the particles were bouncing off each other and causing the bands. The mystery deepened. An interference pattern manifested itself again. The particle behaved as if it was going through one slit while its ghostly twin was passing through the other and interfering with itself. Now, here's where the relevance to dowsing comes in. Determined to get to the bottom of this enigma, the experimenters placed a detector next to the front of one opening to see which slits the real single photon actually went through. The result was beyond their imagination. When observed, the particle reverted to type and behaved just like a little marble, going through only one slit and creating a single vertical band. No interference pattern in sight. It seemed that the very act of, of observing it had caused the photon to go through just one slit, not both. What had happened to its ghostly other self? The photon had apparently decided to act like a particle and not a wave, as though it was aware of being watched. 
When the scientists stopped watching, the interference pattern reappeared. It seemed the scientists' minds had determined how reality had unfolded. So, what is matter, particle or waves? It would seem that both Newton and Young were right. Light can be both particles and waves. Matter exists as waves of probability until the observer, human consciousness, causes, in science jargon, a collapse of the wave function, and reality appears. For some unknown reason that haunts scientists, everything we per we perceive as having mass is just a wave of information or possibilities until we observe it in some way. The double slit experiment shows us that we dowsers create reality just by dowsing for it, the equivalent of observing. So, returning to the original hypothesis of this podcast, do we as dowsers of subtle energies actually create what we're looking for? By focusing our minds and bringing our rods and pendulums and Y rods into play, are we causing infinite probabilities to coalesce into one reality? And is that reality a product of our own consciousness? Or are we acting in partnership with the cosmic creator whose plan depends for its fulfilment on the mind of the humble human. While it's just possible to believe that in some way we manipulate the unseen energies all round us, what about the creation of physical objects like streams or archaeological remains that have probably been there for hundreds of years? Does the same principle, the observer creates reality, apply to solid objects? When we search for water 200 feet under the ground, is the water there or are we creating it? Oh, of course the water's there, you'll reply. It's obvious that a stream has been trickling its way ac across the geological strata for eons and we, as dowsers, eventually detect it. That is the conventional view. But, looked at through the prism of the quantum universe... The stream has only been there for eons because it, quotes, knew it was to be created by human consciousness out of the waves of a million possibilities. It was there because one day you, or some other conscious being, was destined to find it. The divine plan, already nascent, worked out in every detail. It waits only for us to bring it to life. Preposterous? Perhaps. But evidence of this radical viewpoint could be found in a sequel to that dreaded double-slit experiment. It's called the delayed double-slit experiment. Back to the questing mind of John Archibald Wheeler. He set up detectors the other side of the slits to monitor which slit the particle had actually gone through after it had made its choice. The results were astounding. Whichever photon or electron detected after it had passed through the slit always behaved as a particle, not a wave in sight. But those that were not being monitored behaved as waves. The inescapable conclusion was that the particle knew before it even reached the slit that it was going to be observed so it obediently behaved as a particle. It seemed that somehow it had read the scientists' minds, or perhaps it was just playing its part in a predestined scenario. A variation on this experiment has been done hundreds of times since using state-of-the-art equipment, including laser beams, beam splitters, and a device called the electron biprism always with the same results. The observation involving the participation of human consciousness causes reality to jump into being. But is it really possible that dowsers can create such solid matter as archaeological remains or an underground stream just by detecting it? How could this be? How could the ruins of a Roman palace and by implication the glories of the Roman Empire itself, 
only exist courtesy of human consciousness. Here we come back to the co-creation theory. It works perfectly if you can accept that everything is preordained and that life in this dimension unfolds to a cosmic plan which requires human consciousness as a co-creator. The prescient particle above was not reading any minds. It was merely playing its part in the timeless cosmic drama. Admittedly, this idea is a tall order for those who believe in the concept of free will. But a universe unfolding to a meticulous plan is a notion supported by science. Proposing a variation of the above-delayed-choice research, Professor Wheeler pointed out that astronomers could perform the same experiment on light from quasars, those extremely bright, mysterious objects found near the edges of the universe. The experiment requires a gravitational lens, which is provided by a galaxy or other massive object. This gravitational lens splits the light from the quasar and then refocuses it in the direction of a distant observer, creating two or more beams of light. The astronomer's choice of how to observe the quasar's photons here in the present determines which path each photon took billions of years ago. Wheeler's thought experiment has since been demonstrated in a laboratory. In 1984, physicists at the University of Maryland used a light source and an arrangement of mirrors to provide a number of possible photon routes. It was clearly demonstrated that the paths the photons took were not fixed until the experimenters made their measurements, even though those measurements were performed after the photons had already left the light source and had begun their circuit through the trail of mirrors. Wheeler conjectured we are part of a universe that is a work in progress. As it observes itself, it's building itself. It's not only the future that is still undetermined, but the past as well. When we peer back into time, even all the way back to the Big Bang, our present observations select one out of many possible quantum histories for the universe. So, in the delayed choice experiment, either the light knew it was destined to be observed by a human consciousness far into the future and behaved accordingly, or its behaviour was predestined as part of a grand cosmic plan in which we're co-creators. Either way, we dowsers are playing our part in the destiny of this planet. Well, dear friends, thank you for staying with me through this episode and hopefully through the other 14. If you've enjoyed your journey, put the word out and encourage your friends, family or anyone you think might enjoy it. I've got plans for another series of podcasts on the power of the human mind and the more like-minded people I can share it with, the better. All my podcasts are based on three books in my Psychic Mind series, which you can find on Amazon or most other major digital outlets. So I'm looking forward to sharing with you more journeys into the fascinating world of the human mind. But for now, goodbye. <laughs>